All right, here we are. This is Jay Brown Yoga Talks podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Good morning to you, or good afternoon, or good evening, wherever it is for you. But it's it's early morning for me, y'all. Much earlier than usual. First, I want to acknowledge anybody who might be here for the first time. I always want to do that. If, if somebody's coming to the show for the first time today, hey, I'm Jay. Welcome to you. And I also want to acknowledge everyone else. What's going on, y'all? As I was just mentioning, it is early in the morning for me, much earlier than I would ever normally be doing this. But I'm coming to you under some extenuating circumstances. I was actually intended to do this last night. I had this idea that I would do it like old times. Some of you may remember, I used to always record the intros late at night, you know, very late. (laughs) And I stopped doing that because, I don't know, my energy started to change over time and I would be getting kind of loopy and like saying stuff that I didn't need to be saying in the intro. <laughs> so I don't know. I switched it and I've been doing it in the, in the, you know, late morning, afternoon time. And I, I'm leaving today. I'm heading back to Virginia for a week. One, one more summer trip with the girls before school starts. And, you know, I had to, get it done before today because we're leaving. I'm driving today, a whole driving day. But I didn't get it done because last night when I went to do it, I just, I was so out of it. I didn't have it. I couldn't, I couldn't make it happen. So now I just got up early and I'm having my coffee and now I'm, I'm sitting here doing this. It's very unusual for me. But as I like to say, the show must go on. So, here we are. Good to, good to be with you. Thank you for listening. And I don't know the rest of you out there, if you've got kids, if they're already back in school. Sometimes these days the kids go back early, but we've got like two weeks before the girls go back to school. I'm not going to lie. We're, we're a little bit nervous about how the transition back to school is going to be for my youngest. Those of you who know what's been going on with her, Things have been better, and we're feeling okay about the prospects, but I don't know. It could go south, and I I know that. So I'm just trying to, you know, as I also like to say, keep my wits about me. And in many regards, I think today's conversation with Glenn Murphy is about very much that. You'll hear, Glenn is a Systema teacher, and I mentioned this to him, but it's come up a couple times. Systema, if you don't know it, it's a, um, I don't even know how I'm supposed to describe it. I'm going to let him describe it for you in just a few moments when when we get to it. But it's a martial art of sorts, but it also can be utilized and very often is being utilized as like a self-development tool, and even more than that, as you'll hear. And the way I heard about it was from my friend Taryn Rosenthal and Blake Tedder, who was on recently, both people who I resonated with. We had similar explorations into different somatic movement modalities and philosophical ideas. So... That they were kind of into Systema was like piqued my interest. I was like, wait a second, if Taryn and Blake are into it, there's got to be something there. And there definitely is, as you'll hear from Glenn. It was really a great pleasure to learn more about Systema and to, you know, get into some really interesting questions. So I'm glad to have had this opportunity to connect with Glenn and to share the conversation we had with you today. Real quick, before we get to it, I also want to take a quick moment to just thank those of you out there who are premium subscribers. Specifically today, I want to say thank you to 
Joanna Katz and Anna Walton. Thanks, Joanna and Anna. We are so grateful to you. If you're newer to the show and you didn't know this, the most recent 52 episodes of the show are always available on the free public feed. We do also have a premium subscription feed, which houses the archives and is really the way that people who listen to this show help support us. It's choose your rate. You cancel at any time. And in fact, if you don't have any money and you want to listen to an old episode, all you do is email us and we give you a free account. But if you you have a little something to give. It's how independent media like this is able to survive. And we're very appreciative to people who make that gesture. If you want to learn more about becoming a podcast premium subscriber or find any of my other stuff, my live stream classes, the weekly teachers, Sangha, all the other stuff that I'm doing, you can find it all at jbrownyoga.com. Okay, y'all, as I said, I'm squeezing this in early in the morning before I make the drive to Virginia. So we're going to keep it tight. I will touch base with you on the other side. But let's go ahead. Let's get to this conversation that I had with Glenn Murphy. Hello. Hello. Glenn. Hey. Hi. Nice to meet you. I'm Jay. Likewise. Nice to meet you, Jay. Sorry about uh, letting you down earlier in the week. No, so. no, no <laughs> worries. Stuff happens. Everything is okay with just internet issues, huh? Yeah, yeah. We, had, uh, we keep getting outages in the area that I'm in, uh, in Durham, North Carolina. And uh, we're pondering trying to switch providers, but they're not much better than each other, you know? So not much you can do when the whole area goes down. You know? No, no. <laughs> and so much of what we do these days depends on that link, huh? Mm-hmm. Sadly, yeah, we're kind of marooned, aren't we? It's like a little island. I know, I know. Well, maybe we can talk about that later. I am already yeah. recording, and I'd like to consider us having just begun, if that's okay with you. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Very cool. Well, Glenn, I, I'm glad to get a chance to talk with you. I've been looking forward to it. I think I mentioned an email to you, but I'm not really sure. But even just for everybody else listening as to why you're here today, Mm-hmm. You know, I had a few conversations in the last, I don't know, six months even, and two of those conversations, Systema came up, mm. and they were with people. You might know one of them was Taryn mm. Rosenthal, who I think was on your show once. Yeah. yeah, he's a good friend of mine. I've known Taryn for probably about 12, 12 13 years, something like well, that. Well, there you go. Taryn and I went to college together, went to NYU and studied like postmodern dance and did experimental theater together. Very cool. Yeah. And then more recently, I had a guy named Blake Tedder on. Yeah. You know, Blake also. So Blake came on and mentioned Systema. And what was so intriguing to me is that the conversations I had with both Taryn and Blake, they had, they were around the fact that we've all been sort of like exploring different, like somatic movement modalities. Mm -hmm. And some of them, the questions were around like form and like how much like having set form is useful and how much you kind of sometimes want it to be more improvisatory and come from somewhere else in you or to tap into something else. Yeah. And then also it was about how those practices, those somatic movement explorations, whatever forms they were taking also Mm -hmm. played into essentially like spiritual practice and ideas about higher consciousness and even like animistic worldviews instead of like materialistic worldviews. And Mm. so to me, the fact that both Taryn and Blake, they both mentioned Systema as like part of what they consider an integral part of their spiritual practice. Mm. And when I like looked at it, they both mentioned it and they were kind of both kind of vague about it. There's not that yeah. much about it online. Yeah. But it w- or what there is is confusing and contradictory most of the time. Sometimes I appreciate you admitting that up front to yeah. me. Because what it was intriguing to me is kind of the idea that, you know, Blake kind of joked about it, that there was sort of this spirituality to punching people. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, they're absolutely. And is. I'm intrigued by that. So, that's all a little bit of context that brings us together. And, and then just like okay. I said, in getting ready to talk to you, 
I've had some curiosities about both Sistema and you. So I really appreciate you accepting the invite and just giving me the time today. I thank you for that. Oh, you're most welcome, and uh, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Very cool. Well, I guess to start, because it is a little bit obscure for people listening, and maybe for me too, you could give us a little bit of an overview of what are the origins of Sistema, what are so, who are some of the teachers that have shaped it, and what do you think are some of its defining characteristics in comparison to like other martial arts or yeah, so questions two and three there are a lot easier to answer than question number one. Okay. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of, um, uh, there's there's an aspect of kind of a little bit of mystery or de- deliberate obfuscation or other things going on when trying to pin down exactly what the origins are. So there's, there's the one kind of martial origin story as to where some of the movements and drills and practices came from. Um, and that's mostly with, I believe like the the synthesis of kind of traditional Slavic fighting arts, like martial arts, like um, Cossack horse riding and sword play and wrestling and just kind of very, very old fighting forms um, that are not really related to most of the Japanese, Chinese or Indian forms that that populated most of the West, rest of the world's, you know, popular martial arts, um, basically. So they're quite distinct and the movements are quite different. Um, So there's that aspect as to to where the combative kind of parts of it came from. Um, On a spiritual level, the origins are thought to, the origins of the philosophy of it are kind of infused with exercises from kind of orthodox russian orthodox christianity and specifically like hesychistic monks and the breathing practices and kind of stoicism that they practiced um and kind of put together with with those so there's that kind of spiritual route there's the martial combative route and then there's this kind of militaristic synthesis that happened in kind of post-world war one years in which um the former soviet union uh, kind of like military leaders in the former Soviet Union pulled together some of these kind of teachers of combat practices, um, kind of like Cossack bodyguards and, and fighting trainers and things like that, and and then tried to deliberately create <coughs> systematic um, training systems for their um, for their kind of officers and for their intelligence personnel and and for people in kind of high level bodyguarding it said that lenin's bodyguards were trained in sistema you know they were kind of cossacks trained in it in the old school of it um and then during the post during the kind of cold war this got a lot more deliberate and scientific and it was infused a lot with the kind of the the study of the biomechanics and of um movement and kind of somatic education that would allow ostensibly people working in military or espionage environments to, to learn natural and spontaneous movements that would serve them in terms of um, physical protection, but also to learn kind of like a mindset that uh, instills resilience, adaptability, and an ability to kind of adapt to any situation. So where the kind of the frontline soldiers and people in the front lines were learning more kind of like, you know, uh, sambo wrestling or karate and things that would just allow them to, you know, smack people around if they got into a hand to hand fight or something. Um, it was the people kind of further up that were taught to kind of control their emotions, to control their kind of interactions with the world and to, and to leave their, their pre-described kind of reflex reactions to things behind in favor of more kind of cognitive chosen responses, even under extreme kind of um, situations or stress or pain or whatever it's going to be. So uh, that's kind of a long answer to no, a short no, question. No, but there's not kind of, at all. It's there's, there's a military, yeah, there's kind of like a, a traditional kind of fighting route to it, which is what makes it a martial art. And then there's this kind of spiritual infusion of philosophy and breathing and practices and things that are probably quite aligned with lots of parts of yoga and other things like that. And there's, there's undoubtedly a lot of cross pollination mm-hmm. um, between the two, you know, um, way way long ago but it's hard to figure out where where and when that was um and then this kind of more modern synthesis into military stuff and then actually a, a, an additional break which happened after the split of the old soviet union in which some of the officers and people that were trained in the system left the soviet union uh um, notably my teacher vladimir vasiliev moved to toronto and canada and um and then started teaching it um, as a as a civilian martial art, like not something for bodyguards necessarily, or you know people in you know action 
employment, um, but for people who just wanted to study it as a form of self-defense or a form of self-development. And it was really Vladimir Vasiliev bringing it out of Russia and kind of opening it up to a larger non-military crowd that has kind of changed Sistema from something that was exclusively practiced either by, you know, traditional fighting families in Russia or, um, or people within the military. And now it's kind of wide open and there's kind of a Sistema instructor in pretty much every state in the, in the United States. And it's very popular in Japan. It's um, growing in popularity throughout Europe. Um, and it, there's pretty much Sistema instructors on every continent apart from Antarctica, I think. So, <laughs> so it's one of the, even though it's fairly niche, it's, um, it's one of the fastest growing martial arts in the world now for a variety of reasons, but it's, um, most people still don't know what it is or where it came from. And it's and it's worth saying that the name Sistema was not really applied to it until the 1990s. So it, it had a lot of other kind of names. It, Sistema just means the system in Russian. Um, <laughs> and before that, it was called various things. It was called the, you know, the Russian phrase for just self-protection. Or um, it was named after some of the key instructors or proponents that helped to develop it within the military. So there was kind of a Sistema Kadoshnikova named after Kadoshnikov. And then there was a um, Sistema Oryabko, which is the system kind of that I've studied under most. Um, and then there's a few others like Sistema Rechwinski and things like that. And so there are kind of like offshoots of it and they have different emphases. Some of them are a lot more martial and combative and based on physics and biomechanics. And some of them are a lot more contemplative and, and based on the kind of uh, spiritual self reflective aspects of practice and health. So um, there's quite a spread within, within what's called Sistema worldwide. Yeah, that's interesting. And it's interesting how when you were referring to different I don't know what you call them, schools within Sistema or approaches to Sistema. It was like somebody's name. So is it about individual teachers' interpretations? Is it, is it, is it open to interpretation? How much can it be standardized and how much was it more like about interpersonal communication? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think in every martial art, you see, you know, um, this kind of passing of traditions and oral tradition particularly you know when things aren't written down it's just oral and physical tradition mm -hmm. being passed down from person to person same in yoga same, of that same in yoga <laughs> yeah same in yoga and you know tai chi or in, in any number of other things and you end up with branches that are associated with a particular sect or a particular person right in in tai chi you have you know yang and chen style tai chi that are named after the families that developed it the most i think during the 1800s or earlier periods um and in Aikido, which I practiced for many, many years before I took up Sistema about 20 years ago, um, you had the founder of Aikido, um, Yeshiba Morihei, and then his students um, split off in various directions, emphasizing different aspects of what he taught. So Koichi Tohei was more about um, the use of energy and, and feeling energy between people. And then Kenji Tomiki was more about how do we compete with this? How do we break bones? You know? <laughs> so depending on the individual's personality, I think sometimes when something is principle based like tai chi or um or aikido or even yoga to an extent right there are principles and there are some scripts and there are some kind of texts which help you kind of um anchor yourself to what is and isn't within the set of things you might call yoga or tai chi or whatever it is and um, there's there's a lot of room for interpretation um and so i think that's been part of the reason for the divergence and that's a natural thing that you see across different modalities of physical study and you know self development everywhere but another one is that sistema at least the style that I practice is unashamedly evolving, right? It's, it, it's, it's not restricted to a series of, um, physical structures and drills in the manner that you alluded to with Blake and, um, Taron. It, it's not restricted to like you practice this form again and again, and then you do this response in the way that you might with Tai Chi, for example, or something like that. It's, it's basically an operating system. It's a, it's a way of understanding your body, your psyche, um, your emotional responses to things, um, and then making use of that information in order to strip away levels of artifice and fear and excessive responses and trauma and things that you've ac accumulated throughout life to make you kind of psychologically cleaner and better able to respond to things generally, to, to challenges and responses. So one of the things that you could use that for is as a martial art, um, but you can also use it for any number of other things to do with interpersonal relationships towards, you know, it's developing yourself in a somatic sense. So it's, one of my uh, friends, Martin Wheeler, likes to say that um, Sistema is an extraordinary operating system that also happens to be an effective martial art. 
right? So mm. it's not a martial art and, and that's what it is and you can do other things with it. It's a system of living and being and interacting with the world. And one small corner of that can be applied in defending yourself against people punching you or hitting you with sticks. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really think that there's, you kind of pointed to it, this kind of connection between self-defense and self-development and this characteristic of Sistema that you talked about where it seems to me about adaptability and yeah. the ability to be present in certain ways. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. Uh, that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah. and that, mm-hmm. that does seem to me to, is where there's lots of crossover with yoga and then how you practice that or develop that uh, is mm. intriguing to me. But I, I want to put a pin in that for just a second. We're going to come back to that because I am sure. curious. You mentioned that you studied Aikido and you know, I mm. have very little experience with martial arts. The only little experience I have is I had a good friend who's like a black belt in Aikido, and he took me to his dojo a couple of times many, many years ago. Yeah. And so I'm intrigued by that because I know you spend a lot of time studying and teaching Aikido first. So I'm just kind of curious. Also, I read in your bio <laughs> that you have a master's degree in science communication, which I do. Is, is interesting to me as well. So I'm just kind of curious about that background. And I believe it was when you were getting this master's degree and teaching Aikido that you discovered Systema. So I'm kind of curious to go back to where you, how you got to Systema. And I guess maybe a good place to start is how early in your life did you start doing martial arts and did it start with Aikido or were there other modalities or forms that you were in first? Yeah, I started pretty young. I think my first lesson was probably I was about seven and I started doing judo or karate, probably inspired by like, you know, the karate kid in the early 80s and all the things that went around that. Um, and probably also I, there was a couple of bullies in my primary school and I, I just thought I'm never going to be the biggest or the strongest guy around. So maybe it's worth learning how to defend myself and other people so that I can be, you know, a helpful person, really. I think there was kind of a motivation in that. Um and so I started studying karate and judo a little bit, but not very seriously, kind of took them on and off. Um, and then did jujitsu when I was kind of like an early teenager, coupled with um, fencing, actually Western style fencing. So I did foil and saber fencing. So I would always had an interest in this kind of one to one dynamic of conflict and w- what it instills in you, you know, the responses that come up when you start to fight with somebody for want of another word. I don't think I ever had a, you know, a vicious streak or a, or a need to break people or anything like that. But I think I just wanted to understand initially my own fear of it and then to kind of, I don't know, immerse myself in it to the point that it didn't bother me so that I could be useful in the presence of it. Does that make sense? It does. And I could just imagine like I was the young kid who I didn't get bullied around because I had like a lot of personality and charisma my way into people's, you know, good graces. But I I never, I've never actually been in a fight in my life. I could just imagine though, Mm -hmm. as a young boy, having some of that would kind of have, there'd be a confidence that would come with that. I imagine. There is. Yeah. And, and, and to be, to be clear on it, I wasn't really bullied. Um, you know, there were bullies in my school, but they mostly bullied other people. I had the same kind of thing. I'm fairly gregarious and I could talk my way out of most things, you know, <laughs> and go to bladder or just make friends with people. Yeah. Only fight I ever was almost in, I talked my way out of, you know, definitely. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you're, if you're a good, good runner or a good talker, often that's a good po- ma- manner of self-defense. Um, but there were, there were bullies in kind of my primary school. And then when I went to a secondary school, it was an all boys school. So you just kind of get that, you know, mm. ego driven, monkey fighting happening it's it's not very serious nobody's going to get horribly hurt but it's just kind of scuffling for status all the time you know that kind of thing um and i saw people get bullied quite a lot and stepped in quite a lot and ended up becoming kind of like a de facto rescuer of people from, from bullies when i was in my school i'm not sure how i fell into the role but it, it ended up happening two or three times um and then i think probably that drove or motivated my need to get better at it you know if, if i was going to put myself in harm's way this way i'd better learn how to at least lose properly, you know, <laughs> not, not get terribly hurt if I was going to get beaten up by two or three people or something like that, you know, taking them on. Um, and so in the process, I kind of, I think I just graduated from simpler and more aggressive martial arts like karate or, um, jujitsu in a sense to, um, to more kind of sophisticated or in, in my view, what was more sophisticated was looking at like, how do you kind of start to think about conflict on just kind of a level of 
absolute physics, not just that I have to learn this thing with muscle memory and then respond faster than you can or do weight training until I get bigger and stronger and faster. But like, how can you genuinely learn enough skill that you can just outclass somebody and then you don't have to hurt them, right? You don't have to bludgeon them to death. You can just, you know, throw them and pin them down and be like, are we done? Are we good? Right. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's what kind of motivated a little bit my move into Aikido. Although I never really took that up until I went to university in Aberdeen in Scotland and there was an excellent Aikido teacher there. And I studied that for four years in, in Aberdeen and then ended up going to Japan for two years um, to study Aikido specifically. So I studied at the Iwama Dojo, which is kind of world famous in the Aikido world. Um, about two hours north of Tokyo in, in Japan. And so I spent a couple of years there and, um, you know, studied Aikido extensively, came back to London, started doing a master's degree in science communication, as you said, at Imperial College in the, in the center of London. And, um, and I was teaching Aikido and I was still studying Aikido, but there, was, there were still parts of me that made me realize that there, there were gaps in what I could do, right? Um, my, my skill and my ability to, you know, twist somebody's arm in a million different ways and manipulate them and things were all fine and good, but I still wasn't confident that I could fight off two or three people or if one of them was armed, you know, um, or if somebody knew what they were doing with, you know, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and they got me on the ground. I, I, had a, I had a sense that there was something missing and that I just couldn't, I wouldn't be able to fully uh, perform under some circumstances. So partly, again, it was that slightly fear-driven, I better make sure that I'm coherent here in what I'm doing. Um, but I, I started exploring some other martial arts, a little bit of Filipino martial arts and Chinese internal stuff, um, and then came upon an advert um, that somebody had stuck up at Imperial College saying, come try Russian martial arts, no belts, no pajamas, no nonsense, right? <laughs> Basically, and I just have one of those like pull off tags, you know, where you pull off a, an email or a phone number. Yeah. Um, and they trained in the basement of a pub on, on the campus in Imperial College. And it was, it didn't look like any martial arts dojo I'd ever seen. There were no mats on the floors. It was just hardwood flooring. And I walked in and there were six, seven guys and they were just throwing themselves, throwing each other around and hitting these hardwood floors. But they were making almost no sound and no impact. They were falling like cats. They were just so soft in their movement mm. um, that it was incredible. I, I, I just couldn't believe the, the physical control and dexterity that they had to begin with. And then when I started to work with them a little bit, um, the instructor, a guy called Sam Denby, I believe his name is, um, who'd also, funny enough, done Aikido before Sistema, um, invited me to try and put an arm lock on him or control him in some way. And I just couldn't. I couldn't get anything on him at all. He was just slippery like an eel. And he just seemed to be standing in, in the next place where I was thinking about going before I was even there. And just, it was like being a five-year-old fighting your dad. You know, mm. he was just kind of like dropping me on my butt again and again. And I just couldn't understand what was happening. And and I realized that I was being outclassed, that, um, that this person and these people had a level of understanding not just of martial arts and of fighting techniques, but of themselves. They were so calm, like nothing was happening. There was no aggression in this. And even when they were punching, um, there was no aggression in the punch. You just felt like, I don't know, it was like a, a, a very sudden deep tissue massage that made you just want to sit down and rethink your life <laughs> <laughs> instead of like a concussion. So, so, so I was intrigued by that and started training on and off with them. And then it's when I really moved to the United States in 2007 and then finally met Vladimir Vasiliev that, that I dropped Aikido and then shifted across to um, training Sistema full time. And, and the insights have just never stopped since then. It's been just an ongoing font of insight and knowledge and practice and it, it never really ends however much you think you know there's just there's more depths to be plumbed you know so it's um it's uh, so now i think i've and for some time i don't really train anymore because i feel like i need to learn to defend myself better and you know i've i'm pretty confident i can defend myself against 90 percent of people and that other 10 percent is not for want of extra training you know there's you're never 100 percent invulnerable for anything um so i don't really worry about it i now train mostly for my own self-development and that's a fairly common practice arc i think for people in systema they they come for the self-defense and for like the practical aspects and then they stay for the ancillary benefit benefits of being able to control your emotions being able to respond well under stress to things that have nothing to do with conflict and fighting you know just job stress or you know arguments with your spouse or whatever it's going to be it just has so many kind of knock-on effects for your wider life as as i understand yoga does you know same kind of thing yeah and Thank you for that. I'm so intrigued by um, what you said because it goes to this kind of questions that I was asking with Taryn and Blake, even around form. Like you talk about mm. some forms of martial arts where it really just is about getting stronger and faster and knowing the right moves to 
beat your opponent or whatever. Sure. And then yeah. you talk about more uh, subtlety or nuance in a move to Aikido, which I only, I remember that having an element of, it was me trying not to hit the ground too hard, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but yeah. Um, like it was all, it seemed to me be about redirecting energy and like other kinds of um, concepts other than just, you know, smash your opponent. Although they're always, sure. even after you did, there was like break their hand at the end or whatever. <laughs> there was always a little <laughs> smash at the end. It seemed like a little flourish. Right? Like a little, the end you got to teach them yeah. a lesson or something at the end. Right. But yeah. then you talk about this experience of meeting this systemic teacher where even that more subtle use of forms, because you do learn all those moves in those forms Mm. Was you, that teacher was able to kind of outsmart it because that teacher wasn't bound by any particular form. It sounds like that. Exactly. Yes, yeah, exactly what it is. He was, he was exploiting my adherence to form, right? I, Aikido is in some ways a little bit more formless than say karate, right? Where there are very strong stances and movements and techniques. Like Aikido is quite a bit more adaptive, but it still has a stance. It has a position that you take, right? And it has um, an expectation of what's going to happen when you grab somebody and, and, and a sequence of events that you think you can make work after you start to apply an arm lock, right? Same thing with jujitsu and a lot of other kind of grappling type things. Um, and he was exploiting that expectation, that psychological expectation that I had that, that I was stable and that I could move from here to here. And he just appeared in those places first. First, right? yeah. And um, and he wasn't tied to anything in particular. Um, but I, I soon learned after studying a little while in Sistema that there is an interplay between having to study a little bit of form mm -hmm. and to understand the rules, and then you learn how to break them, right? It's a little bit like, it's more akin to music in a way, right? You, you might want to start playing jazz guitar, but you can't just pick a jazz guitar up with no skill and just start playing free jazz and say, hey, look, I'm breaking all the rules, right? <laughs> you don't know what the rules are to be broken. And it just sounds like a hideous cacophony and it's useful to nobody. But if you, you know, learn a little bit of classical or, you know, standardized Western music first and you understand what is in key, what's not in key, you know, where you might go with this, then when you start to break the rules, it sounds interesting because there's kind of uh, a dissonance there or there's a little bit of kind of tension and then when you come back to something that somebody expects um it resolves itself and there's there's a similar interplay between two people in conflict funny enough um and it's just that sistema starts to initiate that relationship way sooner it, it doesn't start when you're already clasping hands with somebody or you know exchanging blows it happens when you're at a distance and you start to kind of feel and assess what it is the person wants, um, you know, what their psychological state is, how they stand. You can tell so much about somebody just from how they walk, you know, um, not just whether they're injured, but where, how they, they're in, what their intent is. You know, you can tell whether they're aggressive, whether they're scared, whether they're trying to be sneaky. <laughs> you know, there's so many things that you can tell just as you get more sensitive and you can use all of those things in order to, to resolve things. And you can be as brutal or as benevolent as you want to be, but you, you have to understand yourself first in order to be clean enough to see what other people are doing. And that's, I think, where Sistema, coming back to your second question, um, which is what differentiates it from maybe some other martial arts, is that the goal isn't really to add things. It's not to learn new forms and new ways of moving. It's to actually strip away um, layers of tension or accumulated responses to things until the, all that's left is something akin to like a, a, a clean consciousness that's able to respond effect effectively to whatever's going on. And the cleaner you are, um, the cleaner that interaction is and the easier it is to subdue somebody or, you know, make them feel like this is not worth pursuing. And, and if you're not, if there's still a bit of aggression in you or a bit of fear in you, it doesn't matter how many techniques you learn or how powerful you are, that will come out in your movement. And now you could be very strong and you could be very aggressive and you still might prevail over most people. Um, but at the end of the day, you end up escalating conflict because your fear or your aggression ensures that the other person is afraid right? <laughs> All the time. And so you're two frightened animals fighting. Whereas in Sistema, it doesn't, if the other guys are frightened animal fighting, you're not, you remain human, right? You remain completely human and conscious. And your effort is to just be, to see what it is that they want and to remove any fear or emotions or tension from yourself in that moment, in the time, uh, and then just see what suggests itself. And that's really the ultimate goal uh, of the study. It's to, it's to understand through movement and through martial arts, that moment and how to kind of be more clean in your consciousness. And again, once you do that, once you kind of put yourself through the crucible of that practice, that starts to parlay across to other things in your life. 
Yes. And that is a perfect parallel to yoga, what you're saying there. Even in terms of Mm. the way you're describing, I would just call that like, you keep saying clean consciousness. I would call that like Mm. a clear lens of perception, you know? Sure. (laughs) Yeah. Where you're, you're using, uh, it goes to the question about there's a certain amount of form that you'd want to get a handle on, right? Or a certain use of forms. One of my favorite teachers, Peter Blackaby, once said, like, you need something to hang your hat on, right? Like, you need some amount of form to work with, as you said. But what's Mm. intriguing to me is when what you're going for isn't a set form. Like you said, there's not a particular forms it has to take you're you're actually looking for kind of like a state or like a state of consciousness or exactly like a again a lens of perception as you were saying earlier a way of seeing things where you're mm-hmm. able to be aware like have an awareness and to make choices yeah and that's spiritual practice <laughs> that's where it, it is. that's where it becomes spiritual practice not like combat necessarily right yeah, and I know. I think you know. And there are people that train. There's quite a few people actually that train both. My good friend Pascual Antonio, who um, is a also teaches at my school. Um, he's he's a long time yoga adept. You know, traditional yoga. He's studied for many many years. In in the full context of it, he likes to remind people that yoga is not just asanas and poses. Mm-hmm. That it's you know it's a whole system of meditation and you know living and eating and everything. Right. So he's very very deep into into yoga culture and practice. And and he wears both hats you know he 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 loves what yoga does for him and he loves what sistema offers at the same time um some other people are, are primarily kind of yogis or they do their thing and then they kind of use bits of sistema they add it like p- pieces to their toolkit you know um and then there's still others like myself who are pretty f- fully bought in to sistema as the way of training yourself and moving into the world and then we will kind of borrow from different modalities like it from yoga or from parkour or from you know feldenkrais or whatever it's going to be because we feel like we have the vocabulary to interpret what's happening in those modalities as well now maybe we won't get to the full realizations of what you can do with yoga or with feldenkrais or whatever it's going to be but we can see the the base ideas and we can apply kind of that idea of like how do i find that state in the middle of an uncomfortable position or how do i move this one tiny part of my body um, without moving anything else, just a pure awareness of exactly how it is I'm generating that movement, right? And in doing so, how can I just get more understanding of my body and my nervous system and my thought patterns and how they interrupt each other and, um, you know, are not congruent sometimes and then kind of start to unpack that from a systemic context. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's, I keep, we keep coming back to this analogy of an operating system, really. It's, it's just a way of, changing the underlying foundation with which you look at anything. And, you know, I've learned to swim better through Sistema. I used to be a terrible distance runner and now I'm passable. I can run distance, <laughs> you know. Um, I just realized that I was breathing horribly and my structure was very poor and I was wearing myself out just trying to run harder and swim harder, you know. Um, so it, it, it can allow you to, to kind of do better in almost any physical pursuit. Um, but then there's levels, right? Once you get beyond, once you start to realize what you're learning, you start to see that there's just kind of a, a another mountain behind what you learned. You, you might get more effective in a technique. And then you're like, well, what, what does effective even mean? You know, does it mean efficient? Does it mean more powerful? Does it mean faster? And then you get beyond that and you're like, no, it's actually some degree of effortlessness. And then what does that mean? And where do you draw the motivation from and how the two people start to interact before this even starts to arise, you know? And it, so it just depends how deep down the rabbit hole you want to go. Really. And <laughs> some people just skim the surface and other people go way deep and, and, and enjoy plumbing the depths. Well, isn't that true? And, and the same in yoga in terms of layers of meditative absorption or experience or awareness around that experience. You know, yeah. it's a, it's the same thing that you described. And I, I mm. guess it's interesting to me, the way that you're talking about how the key to what you're saying Sistema is about, which is sort of what I think yoga is a lot about has to do with worldview or underlying frames or operating systems as you're calling it. And yeah. getting to that require is like, it's not easy because it's challenging in a different way than having like forms to hang on to like other, other approaches in yoga practice where it's more about learning alignment and where to put your knee over your ankle or even using mm. scientific lenses to stimulate your vagal yeah. tone or whatever. Sure. That's, 
in some way it's more tangible to grab onto yeah. than uh, some subtle inquiry into the nature of existence and your relationship to everything like you're describing, yeah. you know? Yeah. And I guess, you know, my, I'm curious about your teacher because it does mm. seem to me that, as I said earlier, like there's been in yoga kind of a standardization process and part of that was like a mainstreaming process mm. and that these subtle nuances that we're pointing to, whether it's in what you're talking about with Sistema or in yoga, seem to me have a lot more to do with the relationship often that you have with someone, like a teacher. And yeah. I'm just curious if that's true in Sistema as well. Like you said, I'm fully on board with Sistema because it continues to serve you. It seems mm. like Vladimir was a guy who sealed that for you. So I'm curious about that process and how you, how you got from that moment where you were being outsmarted by that one teacher to being so mm. fully on board with it now. Yeah, that's, a, that's actually a really good question. Um, cause it's very true. I can imagine a counterfactual in which I'd experienced that one thing and realized I was outclassed and then went to a systema teacher and it just turned out that he wasn't, he or she wasn't able to explain it to me, right. Or wasn't able to sufficiently embody or demonstrate what it was the other guy did. You know, some people are good at doing things and they're not great at teaching or explaining and vice versa. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so it's, I can imagine a counterfactual on which I, found that and then tried to explore it and then just got very frustrated and gave up and went to do BJJ or something else, you know, <laughs> I mean, I can, I can imagine, or, or just took up yoga for a, you know, or some other form of deep self-development instead. Yeah, I can imagine that happening. Um, I was fortunate in that right at the time that I was tailing off from Aikido and looking for something else. Um, I moved to the United States and literally two months later, Vladimir Vasiliev did a seminar a couple of hours from me in Charlotte, North Carolina. Um, and you know, I was following him on the website and all that kind of stuff. And so I went, met and did this amazing seminar with him teaching and met a bunch of people in the community that were training and then started a training group really in, in North Carolina. There was a few guys that were training informally and I joined them. And then eventually I got qualified as an instructor and started leading the group. And that was the beginning of NC Sistema. Um, but the, uh, I think, I mean, what to say about Vladimir really? I mean, he's just, um, He's an extraordinary individual on a lot of different levels, but he has that background that he used to be, you know, Russian special forces. So he's a, he's an incredibly dangerous individual. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if you, you know, he's, he has the capacity to, to, you know, to do whatever you want basically. Right. And he, he's been in some, you know, very, very difficult and life threatening situations again and again. So he has that kind of, you know, that deep sense of knowing that comes from having experienced things, mm. not through having, you know, played with something secondhand from somebody who once did it in a fight, you know, yeah. he's faced down people with knives and been, you know, fought of crowds and things like that as well, you know? So, um, so he has that kind of life or death experience. He's also, I mean, I think he's a, he's a rarity in his physical ability as well. He was, I think something like third in all of Russia in karate by the time he was 19. Mm. He just kind of took it out and studied it along with his brother and was a phenomenal, you know, karate competitor before he even started, joined the army or started learning system or anything like that. So he definitely has an amazing ability to just mimic people's movements and just, and just do them right away, right? Whether they're <laughs> gymnastic or fighting or whatever it's going to be. He's just, he, he's an incredible, um, and what you call that, like a, Memomorph or something like that. I can't remember. There's a, there's a phrase for it, right? For when you can see movements and copy them almost immediately. Right. He's kind of one of those. So I think he's a bit of a phenom in how he's picked things up. And he's also, I don't know, he's, he's, he's sometimes, you know, you wonder whether or not Vladimir is explaining something the right way because it seems very obtuse or abstract. Um, and then you train it for a little while. And then three years later, something comes into your training and you realize that you just weren't ready to understand what he was saying three years ago, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it kind of just drops into your understanding only later. And you're like, Oh, that's what Vlad was trying to tell me. So, you know, there's this kind of saying that, you know, the cliche that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Vlad's there all the time and he has so much that he can share, but very few people are able, able to grasp the entirety of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, so there's, there's that aspect to him and, and he's also just very kind, you know, and very, he, he never kind of feels sorry for you or allows you to feel sorry for him, for yourself. He's very stoic and doesn't put up with, you know, um, that aspect of like cognitive empathy where you're like, Oh, poor you. He's like, Oh, you should get up and feel less sorry for yourself. You know, <laughs> he's very kind of, you know, he's like a, he's like a, yeah. 
a stern dad kind of or something like that in that way. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, he's, you know, on a, on a personal level, he's, he's just very kind and generous with his, with his time and his attention to you. So all of these things kind of combine to create a personality that could easily kind of, if he wanted to go full guru, you know, and start to really influence people and manipulate them if he wanted to, mm. but he doesn't because he's also very humble and he, he does in some ways he doesn't want to be the master guy. He doesn't want to be the big figure. He's just a, you know, a guy who had some skills who's able to do them and, and do things for a living that way. And he's happy with that. Um, and it's worth saying also that Vladimir still learns from Mikhail Ryabko, who's in Moscow, who's ostensibly the head of our system. Um, so he still studies with Michael and Michael is another kind of strange step beyond Vladimir in that um, it's almost impossible to see what Michael is doing. He's like, his movements are so subtle and so small and he works on such a deep psychological level that it's almost, it's very hard to learn things from him sometimes <laughs> unless you, unless you're actually feeling it one-to-one -one with the person. So, so I think Vladimir has been instrumental, not just for me, but for most people outside of Russia in understanding what Sistema could be and could do, right? So he's he's both kind of the emblem of what it's possible to do with your movement. But also, you know, unlike many other martial arts or self-development disciplines in my experience, usually when you attain that level of skill or expertise or mastery and everybody starts blowing smoke up your ass, you know. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.